Hare Krishna. So today morning discussing about the child in the womb and here Srila Prabhupada explains this extraordinary prayer. And this prayer in many ways demonstrates the extraordinary mood of the Bhagavatam. The child in the womb is saying, although Soham Vasanapi me a place where I am in Vasa, my abode, my place of residence is filled with enormous misery. And yet, he says, Garbha Nirjigamashe, I do not desire, desire to go out of here. Why? Because out there, Bahir Andhakupe, he says, here is bad, but out there it's worse. What is the verse? That we get caught by Devamaya and Sarpati, Upasarpati. If the Devamaya, the illusory energy will catch me. And then the cycle of material existence will continue. So this is a repeated theme in the Bhagavatam where distress is preferred to forgetfulness. See, there is, there is distress and there is forgetfulness. It means we are distress broadly refers to what we are experiencing at the material level. Pain, suffering, loneliness, bereavement, whatever. And forgetfulness is disconnection from Krishna. So I'll talk uh, so we discussed in the previous sessions about how the human body has the special potential. The soul itself has potential to know God, and the human body provides the facility by which the soul can actually know God. Now, today's session, I'll talk, what does it take to know God? One is, like, if you consider the, so, uh, the metaphor of, say, of, of agriculture, the land has to be fertile. The land has to have the potential to grow. Then beyond that, the seed has to be sown. And along with the seed being sown, then the appropriate atmosphere, sunshine, rain has to be there, cultivation has to be there. So we discussed how the soil in one sense is always fertile, but the soil becomes especially fertile in the human form of life. But we see that not all human beings turn towards spirituality or God, although they have the potential. So it's, this land is fertile, but still nothing is coming out. So what is missing? So here we could consider that, look at the environment. Now broadly, environment means that is there pleasure or is there pain? Is there happiness or distress? And how do these affect a person's spiritual orientation or non-spiritual orientation? So I'll basically talk in those whole class in terms of a four square diagram, which will be envisioned. So basically, we could say comfort or happiness. Comfort, let's consider it because we're talking primarily at a physical level. Happiness can be emotional and spiritual also. Comfort and spirituality. If you look at the four, four squares, no comfort, no spirituality. Comfort, but no spirituality. Spirituality, but no comfort. And spirituality and comfort. So there are broadly four permutations we could have. So it's a X axis, the, this axis is the spirituality, that axis is comfort. So now the normal human tendency is to seek comfort. So right now you are sitting, you naturally want to sit in the position that is the most comfortable. Or we could say at least the least uncomfortable. So and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Our bodies are designed to function in a way that should be sustainable. And for that, if there is unnecessary stress in the body, then it's not, that's not conducive. In fact, many times when people do meditation and sometimes they do some guided meditation, you just, just relax your arms, let the breath flow into your body, let it go into each part of your body and let, it, let the incoming breath go in and relax your body. Let the outgoing breath take out all the tiredness, the stress in your body. I mean, there's these kind of meditations, people actually feel good. However, that good feeling is what? Just the pent up discomfort and the stress that is there in the body that is relaxed. So comfort in and itself is not bad. It depends on what we do after we get the comfort. Comfort for what purpose? 
say somebody sits comfortably in a Bhagavatam class, so that they can hear. Otherwise, the bodily discomfort will keep distracting them. Or we could have comfort, everyone sits back comfortably on the wall, and then not so. When we sit for a Bhagavatam class, we may need a backrest, but we don't want to take we don't we want to take shelter of Krishna, not take shelter of the wall, and then fall asleep over there. So we could say that comfort itself is value neutral. A person in sattva, a person in rajas, a person in tamas. Depending on the mode a person is in, they will use the comfort appropriately or inappropriately. So comfort is a basic bodily requirement. And as I said, spirituality is what we are all seeking to go towards. We want to become more spiritual. So let's look at the first case. There's no comfort and no spirituality. Now, in that case, a person is in complete misery. And life is just unlivable. Somehow or the other, I have to get out of this. And that's when, again, depending on associations, if this is none, none, we all will go through these four quadrants at different times. So if there is no comfort, no spirituality, that's where we are. We have to get out of there some way or the other. So a wise way to get out of it would be, so either you, one way would be that you go to comfort, no spirituality, or you go toward comfort and spirituality. But we need some level of comfort. Now if people don't get that, people may even see, seek it in ways that are completely uh, anti-spiritual, not just not spiritual, but anti-spiritual. So people start, say, watching, uh, binging on movies and inappropriate stuff on the net and just getting lost in that. They try to go into an alternate reality where there is some little comfort. For them. So this is a state of misery and this is unbearable. It is unlivable. And everybody needs to get out of it as quickly as possible. So no comfort, no spirituality. That means there is material misery and there is also there is material deprivation and there is spiritual deprivation also. And in general, we all need a certain level of comfort to function. Just like say, on some days, we can voluntarily accept discomfort. Say for example, if you are fasting on a holy day, on Ekadashi or something. We voluntarily accept this comfort so that we can focus on something higher in our lives. But with respect to our food, if every day there's uncertainty, okay, at the time of food, will there be food available or not? I suppose after this class, now all of you want to take prasad, all of us want to take prasad. And there's no guarantee that the cook will have cooked food or not, or whether there will be any food to cook or not also, or whether there will be any time to eat food also or not. Then that would make us restless, that would make us anxious. So the point is that no comfort, no spirituality is something which is a state of extremism and we have to get out of it. Now from there, if we consider the traditional historical world, um, we are not talking about the distant history as described in the Vedas because that largely is untraceable for modern historians. So we look at the way mainstream history is seen. In the past, people were, you could say, more uncomfortable physically. People had to do a lot of physical labor. We didn't have uh, weather control in terms of we didn't have heating or cooling. And when the weather became extreme, people had to live in that. So in the so over the past few centuries, from comf no comfort, no spirituality, to some extent, people have moved up. What we call as progress in society is moving from no comfort, no spirituality to comfort, no spirituality. That's what has been the conception of progress. And in many ways, we have phenomenal comforts now. So we have the kind of comforts that even royalty couldn't imagine a few hundred years ago. Even palaces did not have the kind of sophisticated artificial heating arrangements during cold or artificial cooling arrangements during heat that we have today. So there's no denying that this comfort has increased. Not discomfort has increased. This comfort has increased. So although that has happened, somehow comfort is not equal to happiness. People are comfortable 
but still they are unhappy. So we'll discuss about that a little bit more why that happens. But here, the one way to move out of this quadrant is comfort, but no spirituality. That's one way to move out of the quadrant. And that has been the obsession of modern society. Somehow raise the standard of living. Somehow uh, increase the national gross domestic product or whatever. So now we need to increase not just our standard of living, we need to increase our standard of longing. Longing. What is it that we desire? That if we are going to keep desiring material things, actually suppose somebody is an alcoholic or somebody is a drug addict and their standard of living suddenly increases. Then that means they have a lot of money with them and the standard of longing is the same. They are still craving for drugs. Then actually increasing the standard of living without increasing the standard of longing is the worst thing that can happen for a person. If somebody is, a, is a, into drugs but they don't have money, at least they can't indulge that much. But if they have drugs and they get a lot of money, then they will ruin themselves completely. They will squander their wealth and they will ruin themselves. They will end up adding this. So, when we talk about spiritual growth, it essentially means increasing our standard of longing. Standard of longing means what is it that we long for? Do we long for the things of this world, however attractive and however important and however essential they may be for us right now, they are still temporary. And standard, to raise the standard of longing means to strive to grow spiritually, to, to desire the eternal more than the temporary, to desire Krishna more than the attractive things in the world which come from Krishna. So, this is increasing the standard of longing and that is the essence of spiritual progress. Much of the discomfort and distress in our life comes because our standard of longing is low and at that level either it is not fulfilled and so we are dissatisfied or it is fulfilled but still there is so much more to be got and we stay dissatisfied. Say, I don't have enough money and that's why I am dissatisfied. But I get money and then I start looking at people who have more money than me. And I still stay dissatisfied. So, we, if we want to be happy, we can be happy. But the problem is, we want to be happier than others. And that is impossible. Because there will always be some others who will look happier than us. Especially if we define happiness in terms of possessing certain things which we believe are the sources of happiness. So if I may have very, uh, I may have a very high intelligence, but there may be somebody who has more intelligence than me, and I'll feel unhappy when I see that. If I believe, if somebody has very great looks, but somebody will have greater looks than them. Somebody has a big house. Somebody else has a bigger house than them. So once we think that I have to be happier than others, it's impossible. So we can never be happy. So we need to increase the standard of longing. So spiritual progress means, that, okay, whatever situation I am in, I, I will, instead of desiring the removal of the situation, I will desire Krishna. So we could say that as among these four states, we could say comfort and spirituality. Having both, we could say is the best. Because then we are not distressed at the material level also and we are connected with Krishna also. And in general, it is the responsibility of the leaders of any dharmic society to make sure that people have adequate level of comforts and adequate spiritual resources. We see that Maharaj Parikshit, as soon as he heard about that the Kali is spreading in his kingdom, that Kali is uh, causing evil things among his kingdom, he immediately went to counter that. And what are the evil symptoms of Kali that were described? People started quarreling, quarreling each other, people started lying, people started cheating. Now you could say all this even causes material distress. And when the cow and the bull were being tortured by Kali, now was that material or spiritual? Kali was, feet were being broken. And Parishit stopped it. So what was he doing? He was creating material order. 
he was stopping the disruption of material order and at one level when krishna descends to this world it is to create material order paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya ch dushkrta dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge krishna says in every age i come again and again to disrupt to destroy those who disrupt social order and to reestablish those who will maintain that order so this is 48 in the bhagavad gita so the idea is krishna establishes material order so that spiritual order can flourish the next verse talks about spiritual order 49 is that when dharma is established in society then dharma can be established in the heart janma karma ch me nivyam evam yo vetti tatvatah tyaktva deham punar janma naiti mameti sa arjuna that if then you can you can absorb yourself in my past times become attracted to me and attain me so the idea of here we talk about dharma it is not necessarily morality it is also morality to some extent but it is also basic basic needs being provided for in today's world we might uh, lament about sexual immorality or certain other forms of immorality and certainly it's a it's a catastrophic social break- breakdown that is happening because of uh, what is euphemistically called the sexual revolution uh, because of which families are breaking apart and children are not, not going up properly but still there is a certain level of order in society Now, nothing would function if we pay money to buy a flight ticket and we go we are able to enter into the flight we if you click a few buttons and we order something on the internet and within a couple of days it comes to us so there is order in society and if there were basically no order at all we couldn't function so of course material order has many aspects to it but the point i'm talking here is that uh, this third quadrant where there is material comfort and there is spiritual absorption or spirituality both comfort and spirituality are there that is the place where we can be sustainably in and that is what we all should aspire for in one way the prabhupa they established the krishna consciousness movement to give people spirituality but then he also stress that we need to have a materially sustainable social order and that was his vision for varnashram so that is how in the fourth in this fourth quadrant materially there is comfort and spiritually there is absorption there is purposeful progress so both comfort and spirituality by comfort i don't mean decadent comfort where somebody just is loses themselves luxury comfort basically means there is a basic amount of bodily needs reasonably provided for however in this verse this this quadrant is being talked about we we'll call it the quadrant of what are the four quadrants you guys remember comfort and spirituality is what we are discussing so we discussed till now no comfort no spirituality comfort no spirituality spirituality and comfort and now spirituality but no comfort so what is happening this child in the womb is in a place of extreme discomfort scrambled in the womb and as initially when the womb the womb is fit in the, uh, initially the embryo is small and the baby can fit in the womb and there's not much problem so i was talking with the devotee who is a gynecologist studying that how actually if anything goes wrong with the child in the very early days treating is easier as the child grows older treating becomes more difficult unless the child comes out because everything becomes more cramped the baby kicks and the mother feels it but as the as the baby grows the baby doesn't even have space to kick so it becomes more cramped so it's a extremely uncomfortable position to be in. and yet the child is saying my dear lord i prefer to stay over here i prefer to stay in this discomfort because there is spirituality over here because i am remembering you because i am absorbing you and this is similar is the mood in kunti's prayers vipada santutta shashvat tatra tatra jagat guru bhavato darshanam yatsya apunar bhav darshanam he says i know there is so many distresses in my life 
and I wish that all those calamities befall us again and again. Why? Uh, because amid those calamities, we have your presence. We have absorption in you. And absorption in you means that we rise beyond material consciousness. We rise beyond material existence. So one of my friends is also a good speaker and preacher. He tells that whenever he quotes this verse, he qualifies. He says, I am not offering this verse as a prayer. I am only quoting this verse. <laughs> That means not that I am asking Krishna, please send more calamities in my life. <laughs> there are already enough calamities. We all have enough problems. Mm. But the point over here is that actually when Kunti is asking for this, let more calamities come. So we see this, the Bhagavatam is going way beyond karma. There is always the question, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a universal question. Everyone has. I was um, somewhere in America recently and one boy, small one, six year old boy came and asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? They asked me in such a sweet way. Normally when somebody asks a question, this question, more than an answer, it, it, it triggers a question. I asked, what happened? He said, today morning, I was taking my milk and biscuit and my biscuit, I put it in the milk and it fell and it dropped, it's all over it. <laughs> that was the idea of a bad thing happening to a good person. <laughs> he lost his biscuit. <laughs> so now, what is good and bad? Everybody may have their own ideas. But we all sometimes feel life is unfair. So the Bhagavatam doesn't go in the direction of trying to show how according to the law of karma everything is ultimately fair. There's not much talk about it. Bhagavatam instead models the answer in a very different way. Not why do bad things happen to good people, but what do good people do when bad things happen to them? Like the whole Bhagavatam is about bad things happening to good people. Parikshit Maharaj is a virtuous, glorious king. And for one small infraction, he's cursed to die. Chitraketu is just you know, appreciating and in amazement, she was detachment and he laughs in amazement and he's cursed to become a demon for that. Gajendra is just having a good time with his family and suddenly a crocodile catches him. The gopis give up everything for Krishna and Krishna gives them up and goes away. So right from the first scan to the culmination in Krishna Leela, everywhere we see good things happening to bad people. And what does the Bhagavatam respond? By showing how all these good people take shelter of something beyond the good. That is the supreme good, the transcendental good. That is God. So good and bad are at the material level. But God is beyond the material level. So as long as we equate good, we equate God with good, the problem of evil has no answer. If we consider good and bad as material material level, comfort and discomfort, pleasure and pleasure and pain. If we equate God with good, then the problem of evil has no answer. Because why would God allow such a bad thing to happen to him? Why would if God is good, why is there so much bad in the world? Well, God transcends the duality of good and bad. What God wants is not the bad, certainly, but God what wants what is not even the good. He wants something better than the good. And that is spiritual. So sometimes in devotee's life, so we could put good and bad in this analysis in terms of presence of comfort and absence of comfort. Good means, okay, my wealth is good. My, I have enough money. I have good health. My relationships are fine. My mind is peaceful. That's good. And bad is, all these things are falling apart for me. So if, if we equate God with good, then the world becomes inexplicable. Especially if you are trying to be devoted to God and bad things are happening to us. Why is this happening? But if you understand that discomfort or lack of comfort, that is not God's primary purpose. His purpose is to give us something beyond the good. That is the eternal. That is He Himself. Attraction to Him. Love for Him. 
so sometimes when we see throughout in this four quadrant when the in the characters fall into this you could say 1 2 3 4 fourth quadrant where there is no comfort so suddenly all comfort is taken away they beg and pray that let me be spiritual let me not lose you and what he is preferring is if we can consider i am here comfort and no spiritual sorry no comfort but spirituality so if i go out it will be comfort but no spirituality a child who is born new born the child is uh, comforted in every possible way by doting parents and of course it is their duty to do that nothing wrong in that but in the process the child's spirituality is forgotten and thus we end up staying in illusion so now the question comes up should we also seek so is it that being in this uncomfortable situation is what increases the chances of our becoming spiritual so is it that discomfort leads to spirituality or to put it even more provocatively say we are all told to be humble and is it when we are humble then we can absorb ourselves in krishna so if so we all start insulting each other we say i am doing this to make you humble would that work if we all we all have to become humble and we all just start insulting pointing out the faults of the other insulting each other so you are proud i am doing this for your good if i don't do this how will you become humble now, would that work it wouldn't work why because in our relationships if we want to feel connected we want to feel valued so that we can grow spiritual so the idea is that we should become humble ourselves not that we take it as our task to make others humble yes we want to make everybody spiritual as much as we can and sometimes we have to tell people when they do something wrong which can humble them but the primary mode of our interactions is amanina manadina be humble yourselves but offer respects to others so it is there is a difference between humility and humiliation humility takes us closer to krishna but humiliation doesn't take us closer to krishna humiliation makes us sink more and more in the mode of ignorance it takes us further and further away from krishna of course if somebody is spiritually strong and spiritually purposeful even in through a humiliating situation they might take that as opportunity to go toward krishna but there is a fundamental difference between humility and humiliation humility is false ego rejected and humiliation is false ego frustrated i want to be great but the situation the, in the situation i was proven to be i was shown to be worthless i was shown to be useless i was shown to be immoral or incompetent or whatever and that pains enormously so that means in this four quadrant again we may we may think that okay by putting pulling a person down some pegs i'll bring him the situation bring them in the situation of no comfort and spirituality but they may go into the comfort zone of no comfort and no spirituality and if devotees behave like this why should i even be in the community of devotees if devotees are so judgmental so harsh i don't want to be here so just suffering itself of any kind whether it be we could say uh, our ego needs some comfort comfort not in the sense of pampering but comfort in the sense of acceptance that i am accepted i am valued the word ego often has a negative connotation but prabhupada also talked about true ego is false ego and is true ego so we all need to feel accepted and valued and if we feel rejected and critiqued to shreds i just want to go away from here so we will go away from devotee association into this quadrant of so no spirituality and no comfort so as a it's not that just by taking somebody's comfort away there will be spirituality it's not that some some we may hear some stories of some devotees that they suddenly get cancer and then they start become so serious about spiritual life and then they they get a lot of blessings of senior devotees and then they leave a very exalted consciousness 
somebody be think then that you know okay i am not serious about my spiritual life i want to become serious maybe i should also get cancer then i become serious well it's not that simple you will become serious but you might just become seriously sick not seriously spiritual <laughs> so cancer is not the producer of bhakti it is the blessings of the devotees along with whatever spiritual sincerity that person has coupled together that is the producer of bhakti uh, and the cancer is simply the stimulator so the point i'm making over here is that it's not our job to make people uncomfortable in the hope that they will become spiritual they will just become uncomfortable and anti spiritual or non spiritual at least however so so there is a difference in how we treat others and how we treat ourselves with the application of philosophy what do i mean by this there is a difference say if i am sick then i should think it's probably i must have done so much bad karma in my previous lives or even in this life that this is all the reaction to my own sins but if some senior devotee falls sick we shouldn't think i thought you are a spiritually advanced person but you are fallen sick means you must have done a lot of bad karma so that means you are not really spiritually advanced what kind of dark past do you have no i should never think like that if somebody is somebody very senior and spiritually is falling sick there will be some terrible disease you should see that as an opportunity for vaishnava seva i don't know why this is happening what is going on between this person and krishna uh, but this is an opportunity for me to render some service service to that devotee in gratitude for what they have done for me for what they have done for krishna and through that krishna is giving me an opportunity to serve serve him also through this devotee so we have to have the appropriate consciousness in various situations so if i fall sick and i said if i tell someone actually my you are not serving me actually my sickness is an opportunity for you to do vaishnava seva that would be ridiculous i had to think you know did i was i was i careless about my diet was i careless about my health did i what what did i do what can i do to prevent this i want to serve krishna and i want everyone to serve krishna not that everyone should serve me so we have to have the appropriate consciousness so it's certainly not that automatically putting people putting anyone in distress will lead to devotion however this for us is talking about something else that when one has the when one feels the presence of god that presence of god is so enriching so uplifting so strengthening that one feels i don't want to lose this no matter what with the price i have to pay for this and therefore what the, that light so the child in the womb is experiencing the presence of god and the presence of god is so enriching it feels that if i go out and i again i lose this presence i might have comfort but i don't want to lose this presence no matter what happens so the description like this in the scriptures of people under extreme situations remembering god intensely and desiring let the distress come but i want to remember him i don't want to lose that so we shouldn't think that i want distress rather or i will create distress for others or for myself rather we should think that how great must be the enrichment coming from connection with the lord absorption in the lord that even that which is considered a great deprivation in this world that doesn't affect one much krishna says this yam labdha cha param labham manyate nadikam tatah yasmin sthito na dukhe na guruna api vichalyate once having attained this the state of spiritual absorption in the lord 622 in the bhagavad gita says that one doesn't desire anything more after that. and in this state even if great distress comes upon someone guru na api even if great distress comes still na vichalyate one is not disturbed so disturbances don't disturb the person because that person is getting something much higher so rather than thinking at our level rather than thinking that oh let distress come in my life it will increase my absorption in the lord we should actually see these as indications of how attractive 
absorbing Krishna must be that those who have that they are ready to sacrifice everything else for that and we also try to intensify our desire for the Lord. Now life itself will sometimes put it in the uh, situation of no comfort and then we have the choice whether we have no comfort and spirituality or no comfort and no spirituality. So when life anyway puts us in that situation, we try to be, okay, there's no comfort, but still I will hold on to Krishna. But for steadily practicing bhakti, we can try to situate ourselves in the positions of comfort and Krishna, comfort and spirituality. Not comfort again in the sense of luxury, but comfort in the sense of material stability so that we can focus on Krishna better. And within that, so that's the steady way in which bhakti is practiced. But by hearing extraordinary descriptions like this in the womb, we can increase our craving for Krishna. We don't want to become comfortable in material existence so that we think there's no need to go, no need to rise to spirituality. We want to be comfortable so that we can focus on spirituality more and more. And descriptions like this in the Bhagavatam are very revealing about the glory of absorption in Krishna and they all can increase our desire for Krishna that way. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of what is the relationship between comfort and spirituality. I started by this child, although is an extreme discomfort in the mother's womb, is saying, out there there is Maya, so I want to stay here because I have your remembrance. And we discussed about how these four quadrants that are the center of the class, that what is the relationship between comfort, discomfort and spirituality? Is discomfort the producer of spirituality? Is discomfort desired for those who want to be go spiritual? So if the cases of no comfort, no spirituality, first quadrant, then that's a state of extreme misery. And we just have to get out of that. And the recent Last 400, 500 years, you could say, people, we have progressed materially where we move from no comfort, no spirituality to comfort and no spirituality. And although we have a lot of comfort, still we are unhappy because the hearts are empty, the souls are devoid of anything higher and people are comfortably unhappy. And then, now the ideal situation is where we have both comfort and spirituality. That is what is sustainably required for the practice of bhakti. And Paranashram was about providing material comfort. I talked about is comfort bad? It's comfort is what a basic, we could say also they take a basic body in every, every situation. We try to be as comfortable as possible. Whether it's sitting, we are walking, exercising. But the idea is comfort is value neutral. What are we using the comfort for? Are we using the comfort to become lazy? Or are we using the comfort to become more focused? So the uh, when somebody is in the quadrant of comfort and spirituality that means that they don't have to worry about material things constantly and that's how they can focus on their spiritual growth and I talk about 4, 8 and 9 Krishna establishes material dharma dharma doesn't necessarily mean morality it just means, it means predictable order in society where needs are taken care of by which one can focus on Spiritual dharma, that is Janma Karma Chamedita. And Parishad was heroic because he stopped at one level, for many reasons, but one was he, he stopped the disruption of material dharma by Kali also. But life will sooner or later take away comfort from us. And then we are in the fourth quadrant. So when good things have bad things happen to good people. Rather than philosophically trying to analyze that, the Bhagavatam models right response. What do good people do when bad things happen? So good people see that discomfort as an opportunity to deepen their spirituality. Now we discussed elaborately that discomfort itself doesn't lead to spirituality. And our purpose is not that we make people uncomfortable so that they become spiritual. No. And because that discomfort... When it is in this quadrant, they might just go to this quadrant to discuss no comfort and no spirituality instead of uh, com comfort and no comfort and spirituality. So we don't humiliate others in the hope that they will become humble. We respect others, but we try to be humble ourselves. 
and but uh, so we try to find the place where we have reasonable material comfort in terms of stability and then we focus on spirituality but when life puts us in this fourth quadrant of no comfort in spirituality we can take inspiration from characters like these in the bhagavatam and deepen our spirituality and even if we are in the situation of comfort and spirituality still can see how great must be the absorption in krishna because of the joy of absorption in krishna that even that which is so we consider so vital that is being stripped away and still these characters are happy so if that absorption in krishna is so great let me seek it also so god is not the provider of good god is the provider of something better than good and the bhagavatam addresses the problem of evil why is there bad in the good in a good world governed in a world governed by god by saying that god offers us not the good but something beyond the polarities of good and bad that is he absolve love for him so thank you very much hare krishna any question this point practical topic Uh, I want reflection now on the debate as I am trying to formulate the question, but the reflection is I just recently read a study talking about the idea of um, scarcity consciousness, and there were some psychologists that were studying people that were uh, in poverty and just like rough situations, and just how cog- cognitively they would make decisions in, in, um, in uninformed or improper ways that would actually make their situation where so just this idea of when there's so much lack of comfort there's so much lack of order right then how am I actually able to uh, a lot of times approach and when, when it's disproportionate right when, when when there's not the spiritual understanding of oh this is comfort that's come upon me now now I'm going to have to grow um, and then my question is you, you kind of spoke to it but it's always this question of balance because there's this there's this idea that balance is an individual thing for each person right what is comfort for one person is maybe just comfort for another person um what is sense gratification for another person maybe you know like what they need to be basically comfortable for another um so there's there's kind of an internal clarity that has to come but there's an also guidance How do we how do we um, facilitate an honest opportunity for an individual, for myself, to speak for myself? For myself, how how do I how do I facilitate a uh, clarity around balance and what it actually means for me? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, if since balance is an individual thing how do we try to facilitate clarity for getting the balance it's uh, broadly three things intelligence experience guidance let's take a example of food now how much should one person eat you cannot mandate that you don't need two chapatis or you don't need five chapatis no uh, everybody is individual everybody's activity level is different everybody's digestive capacity is different Everybody's appetite is different. So, with our intelligence and our experience, do we all find out that if we eat too much, then we feel heavy, we feel lethargic, we just feel we don't even feel good about ourselves. And if we eat too little, then also again, it's just that we are constantly craving for food. So we have to look at our own experience. After I do this, how do I feel? And based on that, we decide. So experience is something which we all get. But everybody gets experiences, but not everyone becomes experienced. We become experienced when we use our experiences to learn something. Oh, this is not to be done like this. This is to be done like this. an experienced doctor is not just one who has been practicing for many years an experienced doctor is one who has integrated their experiences into their practice so that the advice that they give is wiser than so if a doctor has been practicing for 20 years 
then the advice that they give after 20 years should be better than what they were giving before 20 years. Otherwise, they have just had experiences. They have not become experienced. So when the experience is processed with intelligence, then it makes us experienced. Another way you could say it, it makes us realized. We realize the knowledge better. So uh, that is with respect to so experience and intelligence. And sometimes, especially if a person has some dietary imbalances, then they may need some guidance, some, some dietary addition. No, they say, I'm, I'm eating this, but somehow I'm feeling weak, weak. Is there something deficient in my diet? Or you know, I'm eating this and still I'm feeling so heavy. I don't think I'm eating too much. Oh, this, this food is not so big. So some guidance is also required. You need guidance from somebody competent. So in general, it is helpful to compare our material needs with food. And in fact, I think two years ago when I had come, I gave a series of classes in Denver itself, I think five Bhagavan classes on how to decide what is our quota. How do we go about deciding our quota? So that is these are three broad principles. Now, to find balance, the key thing is our purpose has to be clear. It's what do I mean by how is purpose and balance related? That it is purpose that provides perspective. It is purpose that determines what is the balance state. So if somebody is purpose at a particular point in their life is that, okay, I want to lose weight. Then their diet will be different from, say, if their purpose, if they want to become a heavyweight boxing champion and they're playing for that, then what is the balanced diet for them will be different. So it is more than seeking balance. First, we need to seek purpose and gain clarity of the purpose. And as our purpose becomes clear, then it purpose provides perspective. Okay, my purpose right now is to grow spiritually. To grow spiritually, I I have found that if I if I fast, then there is no ekadashi. I just get, I just feel weak. I feel irritable. I sometimes uh, feel like burning in my stomach. I comes, I get sick. Okay, that's I'll okay, not do major. I'll take one meal. So, because I, I don't want this to, my purpose is not to deprive my body. My purpose is to increase my focus on Krishna. And if all these body sensations are distracting me from my focus on Krishna, then why do that? So, if we consider our purpose is to, mag, is to maximize our connection with Krishna, our service to Krishna. Now, by connection with Krishna, I don't just mean, say, chanting more or doing deity worship more. Connection with Krishna is also through our, through our family, through our profession, through all walks of our life, we want to connect with Krishna. But if that's what I want to maximize, so, for example, if I want, Bhakti Thakur says that when I come home and I see that my family is also chanting, they are also worshipping the Lord, I feel as if I have come back to Vaikuntha, come back to Goloka. Jedene grihe ke Goloka bhai. I see that my home is also like Goloka. Now, how did that happen? In some people, it might happen automatically. But in some people, that might mean that they have invested in their family relationships enough, but their family is also happy and they are also practicing spirituality. So, that, that is a result of something that has been done. Sometimes our family members may be naturally spiritual and then it happens automatically. But sometimes we may need to invest in that. And just like in any other investment in life, there is no guarantee of returns. Even in direct devotional activities. We might spend a lot of time conducting a program at a particular college, in a particular place. And in the end, nobody becomes a devotee. And then you just, what can you do? So similarly, we may have to also invest in our, in our family relationship, in our children, in our job. And sometimes that gives us a return, sometimes that doesn't give us a return. But if our purpose is clear, then that purpose provides perspective. Having said that, uh, the nature of material life is that it keeps expanding. So, we need to have some basic bottom, basic minimum of our spiritual life that we are going to do whatever happens. If you don't have that, then we say, okay, after I have my material life settled, then I'll practice spiritual life. Well, mm, there are always some loose ends to tie up in material life. And what happens is the loose ends never end. 
I tie up one loose end and another end becomes loose. And another end becomes loose. And the loose end never end. So at one level, some basic amount of spiritual practice is something, no matter what goes on in my life, this is my anchor. This is what I am going to do no matter what happens. And we find if we do that, sometimes we are also able to settle our material things better. Because we are spiritually strengthened, spiritually sheltered. And that helps us. So, it's I think intelligence, experience and guidance. Uh, with focus not on balance, but focus on purpose. And what can per per help me to pursue my purpose the best? It can help us to find balance. Does that, does that help? Thank you. So, any one question? Yes. I'll answer this briefly today, but tomorrow's class is about that topic. So, if spiritual credits are never lost, then how can the soul who is so, so intensely longing for the Lord now come out of the womb and then forget the Lord? Again, going to illusion. No principle exists in isolation. At one level, it is said our spiritual credits are never lost. But another level, we also know that our free will is never lost. So it is not that spiritual advancement takes away our free will. Spiritual advancement, you could say, takes away or decreases our inclination to abuse our free will. But still, the possibility is always there. And uh, if if somebody, again, it's not, the free will is one factor over there. But another factor also is that when we say our spiritual credits are not, are never lost. The, the, the usage is very clear. Neha abhikrama na shows the pratyavayona vidyati. They are never lost, nor are they decreased. But they can become temporarily inaccessible. It's like somebody... Uh, save something in a bank and then they lose the passport. Then they lose a, they lose a not passport, sorry, passbook or they lose their account number, account login details. Then the money is there but they can't access it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I lose things, I console myself. He says, I lost it not because I was so careless but because I was so careful. I kept it so carefully that I can't find it now. And sometimes it is like that. You keep it carefully in some something very important. You keep it carefully in the bottom of some bag, somewhere in some secret compartment. And you forgot where you kept it. So, it's not always, sometimes when we lose it, it's not always because we are careless. Sometimes we try to be cautious and in the process of that caution also things go wrong. But this is something like uh, when we transition from one area of life to another, say the soul goes from one body to another body. Astral comes from the uh, prenatal existence, the postnatal existence, out of the mother's womb. Then there is a big transition. And during that transition, the spiritual credits may become temporarily inaccessible. So the, the credits are not lost, but access to the credits can be lost. And that's what Prabhupada also says is the result of offenses. If we have made spiritual advancement, our spiritual advancement is not lost. But if we commit serious offenses to devotees, especially, we intentionally try to pull down some devotees, then we lose access to our spirituality. The credits are still there. So, um, I'll elaborate on this uh, tomorrow. But, see, what do we mean by spiritual advancement? Spiritual advancement can, at one level, mean that the spiritual credits, the spiritual inclinations, the spiritual attraction, that is, the, the spiritual impressions that are stored in our brain, which, which make us turn toward Krishna. Just like for a drug addict, there are so many impressions about the indulgence and drugs that are stored in their mind, that they just get pulled towards the drugs. 
So spiritual credits, now this is a simplified understanding of spiritual credits and there's much more to it, but just for our context. You could say spiritual credits means the impressions that we have acquired of Krishna Bhakti, they are stored always and they are never erased, they are never cleansed away. Now, it is still for us to choose whether I will act according to those spiritual impressions or I will act according to something else. So, if I choose to act according to something else, then my spirituality may become unmanifest for some time. So, but what will be there is, eventually when you want to turn back, away from sensuality to spirituality, all those credits will be there. And we won't be starting from scratch. We'll be starting from where we have left. But we can always turn away. Okay. So, thank you very much. Radhra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Gaur Prima.